Hi everybody, welcome to Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you for joining us. Let's get a quick take on the New York Times editorial board advocating for the end of the federal prohibition of marijuana. Patty Calhoun from Westward, do you think Colorado had anything to do with this uh, pretty historic decision? Well, I know Colorado had something to do with it because they sent out members of the editorial board to Colorado hmm. to do research. If you look, it's not just the one editorial they did on Sunday but they've had a whole series talking about marijuana, talking about cannabis, talking about how it's worked here, how it's worked other places. Um, and it's a very well-reasoned, thoughtful uh, series. What I love the most, though, is if you watch the Talking Head shows on Sunday, Andrew Rosenthal, the editorial board editor, is out there talking, and he was asked if he'd ever smoked pot. And he said, hey, I went to college in the 70s in Colorado. What do you think? <laughs> so quickly Googled that up, and he is a proud graduate of University of Denver, 1978. And I suspect there was some use of pot at DU in 1978. It came for some background with, with this uh, information, this editorial. David Kopel from the Independence Institute and DU Law School. Uh, obviously, the New York Times is still a big deal. It's not the maybe the biggest deal that it, it, the big deal that it was many years ago. But to have that editorial board come out to call for the end of prohibition of marijuana still seems it's still got a lot of national headlines. The New York Times in-house editorials never ever vary from the conventional wisdom of the Upper West Side of Manhattan, New York City. So you now know officially what the Upper West Side of, of New York City thinks. There are a lot of people who take the New York Times editorials seriously is this imprimatur of what it's legitimate to think and say so it'll be influential in that regard i will say compared to the editorial in-house editorials of the denver post or the rocky mountain news or the washington post or roughly twenty-five thousand other newspapers in the country the new york times is extremely reactionary in that you will never get a new idea out of them they they never push the edge of whatever mental boxes and, and thought envelopes they live in. So the fact that they think it's safe to say this tells you a lot about how public opinion and the conventional wisdom of the northeastern uh, leftist elite uh, has moved in a more uh, progressive, open-minded uh, direction uh, led by Colorado. Even though we don't have roads out here, apparently we have some good <laughs> ideas uh, which can even infiltrate all the way to uh, New York City. Helping to educate New Yorkers yeah. one step at a time. Craig Silverman, attorney with uh, uh, Olivas, Silverman Olivas, and uh, radio talk show host at KUS Saturday mornings. Uh, tell us what you think about what the New York Times put out with the editorial board. Uh, it was interesting, not just the editorial, but as Patty mentioned, the series of articles thereafter. Legalized marijuana has big MO and big CO, CO standing for Colorado. Of course, Colorado has led the way, and there are still some really good arguments against legalized marijuana, but uh, there are better arguments against prohibition, and that's the way the New York Times approached it. And then they got back up from the Brookings Institute, which just praised Colorado's, pardon the pun, rollout of legal marijuana. And that's a pretty well-respected institution as well. So a lot of momentum on the side of legal marijuana. Penn Tate, attorney with Greenberg Traurig and a longtime state lawmaker, wrap it up for us. No, I, I agree with what everyone else has said. And, and I think the New York Times editorial is, I, I think, a game changer in this conversation. And for all of the reasons people stated, but what really struck me was not just the editorial saying repeal prohibition, but as Patty said, it was the series of editorials they ran for an entire week where they covered the health impact, they covered the economic impact, kids, and, and so. It was actually a concerted effort to defend the editorial position and to lay out the current state of science and everything else. And it was, I, I think, a very clever way of saying, here's how we got here, here's why we're here, and we think everybody else ought to come along. Because really, there, where, the, where they left you was that the only argument in favor of prohibition now is an emotional argument. It's not, it's not based on fact or science. Uh, so I think it is a game changer and uh, hopefully for Colorado's sake we'll see some change in federal legislation soon to deal with the banking issue and everything else. 
Denver Mayor Michael Hancock announced this week that he is seeking an outside independent review of the Denver Sheriff's Department and will be holding a nationwide search for the city's next sheriff. Meanwhile, an, a for, another former inmate has filed a lawsuit alleging abuse at the hands of a Denver deputy as two new videos surfaced this week. Patty, I, I know it's becoming a little repetitive on this show that we're talking about the Sheriff's Department, but new issues keep coming up. What did you make of the developments this week? Well, we'd heard about this incident before because just, uh, Judge Bird had even been a witness, and the fact that there's a video of this incident makes it a hard one to argue that he, the prisoner was treated well and uh, is not going to get his $5 million. Well, the problem here, it's great that Michael Hancock is going for He's going outside of Denver to find a new sheriff, which is a good idea, probably would have been good in the interim too, and that he's looking for a federal investigation. But where has he been? He's been the mayor for more than three years. We've had issues with the jail. We've had deaths. We've had beatings. We've had many, many complaints that have gone uninvestigated. And as it turns out, as these videos start popping up, as more witnesses start coming forward, that there have been several incidents that are just not going to be defensible. So the question is, why did it take as long as it's taken? And what, $8 million at least we're looking at in settlements to get to this point? David, while there's going to be problems to happen in any mayoral administration, at what point does this become a serious albatross around Hancock's neck? Well, Hancock's can do the equivalent of, well, it's all George Bush's fault, which is he inherited this problem, and that, that's correct. Uh, the John Hickenlooper administration, while successful as mayor, while successful on, on many fronts, did very essentially nothing to clean up the problems in Denver law enforcement. And Hickenlooper, too, inherited his problems, and you can probably traced all the way back at least to Bill McNichols in the 60s and 70s where you have a huge amount of really good sh sheriff's deputies and police officers but that bottom one or two percent of knuckleheads uh, the system can't seem to deal with them or get rid of them. You can contrast that with Mesa County where like normal Colorado counties they have an elected sheriff who is given by the people the absolute right to hire and fire. So. Stan Hilke, who was, uh, for, has been my client in the past, uh, the outgoing sheriff there, uh, one of the last acts he did was he fired Steve King, uh, state senator who was also uh, working as a sheriff's deputy for allegedly falsifying time cards. So the you had a sheriff who had the power to act and he saw something wrong and he did act. Contrast that with the Denver Sheriff's Office where everything, everybody below the sheriff is civil service, so it's very difficult to address those problems. Even the undersheriff, the number two guy in the office in Denver is civil service. So the sheriff can't, e imagine a president who couldn't even pick who his vice president was going to be. That's the position that, that our new sheriff in Denver is going to come into. Craig, you've had some history at the city of Denver. You worked uh, in the uh, DA's office. What was your history with the sheriff's department back then, and how is the culture different now? Wow. They had my back, figuratively and literally. So I love the Denver Sheriff's Department. I, I don't think it's fair to go all the way back to Mayor McNichols. I mean, uh, it was interesting. I had Kusair Muhammad by the attorney for uh, this latest case that uh, got such a, uh, Jamal Hunter, that got such a big amount of money. And he did the discovery and he told me on my radio show that it dates back to the summer of violence, 1993, when there was a concerted effort by law enforcement to get tougher. Uh, but this is ridiculous, what's going on. I went to the mayor's state of the city address, and he said it was a few bad apples. But it seems like a bit of a culture when you see guys willing to do that around their compatriots and confident that they won't say anything. That is a problem. And where will it lead? Ultimately, it might lead to a total restructure of the safety department. Perhaps Denver police and Denver sheriffs will become one entity because it's not working out right now. It's interesting also to note that he's having an outside review of the sheriff's department, but a hand-picked review of the city attorney and what went on uh, with this litigation. There's a lot to follow here. Penn, has Mayor Hancock offered enough uh, response to the issue so far? 
I don't know if it's been enough. I think it's right, but I think it's where you start and there's going to be more. Outside review, you've got to do it because the, no one has any credit. Nobody thinks that, that the sheriff's department is credible, nor do they or probably should they have faith that they can conduct their own internal review. Um, you, you probably do need to bring need new leadership from outside of the department. You know, as we've talked about before, and as I've said before, twice is a pattern. Um, and when you get this many inmates getting, you know, treated this badly, on videotape in courtrooms where judges are sitting as witnesses, you have a problem. And I think Craig is right. It reflects a culture because you've got this code of silence where I'll bet the vast majority of the good sheriffs see this stuff, but they just don't want to speak out. And there's another interesting dynamic here also real quickly, and I, and I hope this comes out. I had a conversation with some folks this week, and some one person said something very interesting to me, and it was an attitude I hadn't heard before, but what they said was, well, after all, they are prisoners, which mm -hmm. sort of was the impression that, well, if their prisoners are in, and they're in the county jail or in lockup, Maybe they deserve to be treated this way. And I think most people would not agree with that, but I just thought it was an interesting sentiment to hear someone actually express in a room of people. All right. Obviously not uh, the only person that feel that way, at least yeah. among the Sheriff's Department. The Republican Attorneys General Association has reportedly moved to make a major impact in Colorado politics. The RAGA made a $2.5 million ad buy in support of Cynthia Kaufman, the Republican candidate for Attorney General, and reports this week claimed that they were behind the $155,000 that paid for ads attacking Tom Tancredo during the GOP gubernatorial primary campaign. David, both moves are pretty historic for an, an attorney's general association in Colorado and could play a big role. Not only was Tom Tancredo the leader in that primary before those ads came out, but $2.5 million in an attorney general contest, that's a lot of money. What do you make of what happened? Uh, as attorneys general have been become much more active on all kinds of fronts, and you can t trace it back to the... Uh, tobacco uh, extortion litigation of, of the uh, 90s and, and on many other fronts, it, it's become a more important office in every state. So it, it, it attracts much more campaign money, in, in, including outside campaign money. Obviously, a, a $2.5 million investment is a sign that they think she's a viable candidate, a strong candidate, but also a sign that, she, that they think it's a, a serious race and that Don Quick is a formidable opponent. Uh, the Republican Attorney General's Association giving money to somebody running for Attorney General as Republican seems fairly normal. What was abnormal and what Lynn Bartles did a great job of reporting in the Denver Post was they also basically legally laundered money from the Republican Governor's Association uh, to put in to do anti-Tancredo ads uh, in the governor's race, which isn't he wasn't running for attorney general. Uh, it's another, it wouldn't shock me to see Mitt Romney's fingerprints found on this if you could examine the full crime scene because Romney's been a major player in Republican primaries nationally, including the, the governor's race, and, uh, and has been actually quite successful. I think he's, he's 16 out of 16 on the races he's gotten into. The argument against it is, you know, A, you ought to, the Republican Governors Association and Raga and Romney ought not to be playing in primaries. The argument on the other side is everybody in the state, with the exception of me and a few other people, thought Tancredo would be a very weak candidate in the fall. And the people who would say put together the Republican takeover of the Senate in 94 said, the, for example, the reason we did that is because we got involved in primaries and because we pushed the stronger candidate out there in the general election. And if you want to you, you want to win, you have to have the party or the establishment uh, pick who's going to be the primary winner. Craig. It this probably won't have a whole lot to change. It's not like the voters are going to read the story and suddenly change their vote for Beaupre or, or Hickenlooper this fall. But if I'm thinking about running as a Republican in the next couple of years, I'm thinking that there's all these different organizations now that maybe want to just do the handpicking whether or not I'm running or not. Does this have a uh, an effect on the future primaries or races among Republicans in Colorado? I, I think it might, but I also think it might affect this election if people uh, who follow Tom Tancredo get upset. And Tom Tancredo can set the lead. Uh, Tom has endorsed Bob, and, but he's been out talking about this, this uh, sideshow. I mean, it's sort of like Casablanca. There's gambling here. 
Uh, who is surprised that Republicans preferred Bob Opre as their candidate over Tom Tancredo? Everybody was talking about it. And where is the spotlight on the Democratic Governors Association that got involved in the Republican primary with really disingenuous ads? Now, John Hickenlooper, who was going to be the opponent, he was a member of the Democratic Governors Association. It's not like Bob Opre has ever been governor. I think you're right about Mitt Romney. There's no disguising the fact that Mitt Romney and Bob Beaupre have great affection for each other, but they genuinely believe that which I think is the truth, that Bob Beaupre is a much more formidable adversary for John Hickenlooper than Tom Tancredo would have been. And now for Tom to demand transparency and how dare you interfere in a race between true Republicans? Well, just last go round, Tom, you weren't a Republican, so it's just kind of interesting. You have to be picky when you kind of call it interference. Uh, Penn, there's multiple things to tackle here. Take your choice. You know, I, I think this is interesting. First, I'll say that this is an instance where I agree with David, because we <laughs> both thought Tank Crater would have been a more formidable opponent to Hickenlooper in the general election. Um, I think Cynthia Kaufman, we haven't talked about her, I think she's got to be concerned. She's now dropped in the, in the middle of this hot mess. She wants the 2.5 million, but all the controversy surrounding where it came from from how it got here and how the Republican Governors Association has played is going to, for better or worse, stain her candidacy, and she's going to have to figure out how she responds because Don Quick's people will be all over it. They won't have 2.5 million, but now they have an issue, and she's going to have to defend the issue, whether it's one she created or not. Um, and I think it's interesting because what all of this sort of reflects in my mind is sort of the cry you've been hearing from people ever since Citizens United and some of these other cases saying we've got to clean up and straighten out how we fund campaigns in this country. There's too much mess on both sides of the aisle. Right. There's too much funny money floating around. You never know who's really your opponent, who's really your friend. You've got issue committees, you've got thought committees, you've got family committees. Everybody's throwing money around, carrying money around in pillowcases, buying ads and stuff. And, and, and it's hard to tell where people are really aligned. You've got all these phony names and funny names for committees. And so I think Colorado may end up being ground zero this election cycle on this issue because of all of this. Patty, wrap it up for us. Well, the Craig is right in one sense. There's nothing more delicious than the Democrats paying to make Tancredo look good back at before the primary. I mean, that was really one of, it was, the cleanest dirty trick you've ever thought about. It was just so bizarre. It's not such a big surprise that the AG's group would go after Tancredo, too, because they want Bob Beaupre. He's much more the mainstream candidate. But I would like to know where the $2.5 is going to go for a Colorado AG's race. I mean, that has never been such a high-priority position. John Southers, who is a Republican, and I've got to think has had bigger things to worry about, given all the same-sex marriage decisions and all those fights going on to know anything about this. But who would pay $2.5 million for this? And where is that money going? It's not going to Channel 12, and I'm it's pretty true. sure it's not going to me. <laughs> <laughs> Although I would I would love to see a, uh, Republican, a ad Republican ad ads in Westford. It'd be great. You take it, put it right <laughs> by the pot section. <laughs> The growing hostilities in Gaza inspired a pro-Israel rally held last Sunday at the state capitol. Several elected leaders spoke at the rally, including Representative Mike Kaufman and State Representative Rhonda Fields. Across the street, Palestinian supporters held a counter-protest. Craig, you were part of the organization of the, protest, of the rally. Uh, you were there. Uh, tell us uh, about what it was like. Well, I was uh, privileged to be the MC, and it was amazing. Bob Beaupre spoke, George Brockler. Lots of people, former Speaker McNulty and Rhonda Field spoke as well. I invited all the Dems, and uh, Don Quick, for example, was dealing with the problem of this money. He had a good excuse, and others did as well, but it was a little disappointing not to see them there. But there were 2,200 people there, and it was a great crowd that was evenly mixed between Christians and Jews, and I'm sure some non-believers as well. I was disappointed with the coverage in the local TV stations because they highlighted the 70 or so uh, pro-Palestine, pro-Hamas protesters versus our 2,200, and um, it, it really wasn't like that. There was some good coverage in the Colorado Observer and uh, today in the Intermountain Jewish News because powerful things were said by the speakers. Everybody had a different take on it, but I, I don't really see the controversy. It's sort of like 
Israel v. Hamas to me is like America v. Al Qaeda. It's sort of like the Islamic State versus the Christians in Mosul. We're talking about a terrorist organization, and Israel is on the front lines fighting a battle. Why should we care in Colorado and America? Because they're fighting our enemy. Hamas would like to kill Americans, like to kill Jews, and as we see in Iraq, radical Islam has Christians uh, in their target area, too. So it, it's a terrible situation. Everybody grieves uh, the losses, and Hamas uses human shields. And you can say, what kind of people would use little babies and women as uh, death porn, so to speak? The same kind of people who would hijack airplanes and run them into the World Trade Center. Penn, if the conflict uh, increases, uh, intensifies, does it become a political issue here in Colorado for uh, a pretty intense election? Uh, you know, I think, I think it, it, it has intensified it well, and I think it's already a political issue in Colorado and throughout this country. Uh, you know, it, it, it just brings back, and, I'm, and, and I thank Craig for his work in putting the rally on, but it just brings back the fact of how interconnected a world we are. All of these events impact us immediately here in Colorado and immediately in this country. And so whether it's the U.S. working with Europe or others, we've, we've got to help to, to bring some resolution to a number of these situations around the world. This is a mess, and it's, it's a horrible human tragedy. Patty, how do you think this will affect Colorado politics, especially in this election year? Well, as I was getting out of the car to film today, they were, uh, the U.N. was just saying that Hamas had broken the ceasefire. And you're going to, that if you can't even keep the ceasefire so you can get in human, uh, humanitarian supplies for women and children to into Gaza, how are we ever going to come up with a solution? So it will be an issue in Colorado. Obviously, we're not in the forefront of the international dealings, but candidates are going to have to think about w how they would deal with this, especially our congressional candidates. And I haven't heard a lot from them yet, but we will be. David, what do you think? Uh, this is not my father's Colorado Democratic Party anymore. You know, back in the Democratic Party I grew up in when Israel was imperiled in, for example, it's when it was attacked by Egypt and uh, Syria in 1973, which were, compared to Hamas, <laughs> you know, quite nice dictatorships. Uh, Colorado Democrats didn't have any trouble doing the right thing and standing up for the, de the democracy. And the, the fact that, that so many of them don't want to take a side publicly in this battle between good and evil is, is very sad. And so it shows all the more credit to Representative Rhonda Fields for defying the conventional wisdom of her party and taking a forthright stand uh, on the right side of things. Well, let's get to the easiest part of the show, Disgrace of the Week. Patty, start us off. Well, I am not sure that having an elected sheriff would solve the problems in Denver, but David brought up Mesa County, and I think we're all very relieved that Steve King is not going to be the candidate for sheriff of Mesa, and Co Mesa County, and in fact has now been hit with some charges on his timesheets and other problems. That is not a good way for a lawmaker to behave. Felony charges, not the way to go to start a campaign. David. The New York Times 538 data-based, supposedly, blog uh, asked Roger Pilkey, the University of Colorado environmental scientist, because Pilkey had dared to write that hurricanes and tornadoes are not all caused by climate change and global warming. Even though he thinks uh, anthropogenic global warming is a real thing, he doesn't think you can blame all the, the hurricanes on them. And the the New York Times got rid of him. It was like as if he'd gone to the Vatican in 1500 and said, you know, the earth revolves around the sun, and people just couldn't hear that, and so they had to burn the witch. <laughs> Craig. Back to Mosul, Iraq, where uh, radical Islam is going around drawing red ends for Nazarene, marking Christian houses, forcing them to leave, convert, or die. And where is the reaction? Um, you know, it scares me because I always thought that if Christians were persecuted the way Jewish people have been, that they would rise up with their strong numbers and never tolerate it. Yet, they seem to be tolerating it. It, it needs to change. Penn. The, the CIA, all of it. Uh, it's, it's almost like the sheriff's department. Every week there's another revelation. You know, now they're busting into the computers of U.S. senators and the staffers who are investigating them. Uh, th this is a mess, and, and it's clear it's going to be even worse.
Season the Nice Pet Somebody, always the hard part of the show. Patty? This is an easy one. Today is Colorado Day, so it's the celebration of the Colorado becoming the centennial state. Lots of free events going on, free movie in Civic Center Park tonight. You can zoom over after you watch this show. History Colorado and other museums are free on Friday and Saturday. There are just a lot of great activities. And when you're done with those, go to the Denver County Fair at the National Western, which should be a blast this weekend. You're here. David? Uh, Vincent Carroll of the Denver Post for exposing the Denver City government's program of causing gridlock and traffic jams. You know, they apparently they thought Chris Christie's week-long uh, traffic jam at the George Washington Bridge was such a good idea. They want to institutionalize, and so they're doing the Chris Christie traffic jam program every day, every year. <laughs> Ride a bus or else. Craig. Uh, there's a Christian group called KUPI, Christians United for Israel. And they are standing up, and they purchased a full-page ad in this morning's Denver Post. Good for them. Penn. Uh, this week, Den Colorado was privileged to host two memorial services for uh, a great Colorado resident, Dr. Uh, Vincent Harding, who passed away. He was a speechwriter for and a confidant of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., so kudos for Colorado being the home of that. And finally, uh, just to shout out, uh, if you get a chance, we all ought to go see Get On Up, the movie about James Brown. It's going to be fascinating, I imagine. I completely agree. That's all the time we have tonight. Thanks for tuning in. For our viewers watching our live stream on our website right now, available every Friday at 1215, stay tuned for a special behind-the-scenes segment. And for our broadcast viewers, we'll see you next week. And don't forget to check out our web-exclusive CIO post-game series at CPT12.org every Friday. For everyone here at Channel 12, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thanks for watching. Good night.